rising generation, completely fixed at the present time in the life of man, and which consists simply and solely in drumming into the pupils, by means of constant repetition to the point of stupefaction, numerous almost empty words and expressions, and in training them to wreck. Ognize merely by the difference in their sounds the reality these words and expressions are supposed to signify, the coachman is still able to explain after a fashion the various desires he feels though only to types like himself, and he is sometimes even able, at least approximately, to understand others. This coachman cabby of ours, gossiping with other coachmen while waiting for a fare, and sometimes, as it said, hurting in the doorways with the local maids, even picks up various forms of what is called civility. In accordance with the external conditions of the life of coachmen in general, he also gradually automatizes himself to distinguish one street from another and, for instance, to calculate how, when a street is closed for repairs, to get to the required destination from another direction.
Summing up all that has been said, the ideas in the lecture will have heard in what I have added today, about the two categories of contemporary people who in respect of their inner content have nothing in common, and about the greatest fact that owing to the progressively deteriorating conditions of ordinary life, particularly the wrong system of education of the rising generation, the various consequences of the properties of the organ kind of upper appear much more intensely in the common presence of people in recent times, I consider it necessary to say, and even to emphasize, that all misunderstandings arising in the process of our collective life, especially in our mutual relationships, all disagreements, disputes, settlings of accounts, and hasty decisions, decisions which after being carried out of Ogin. As the lingering process of remorse of conscience, and even such great events as wars, civil wars, and other calamities are simply the results of a property of the common presence of ordinary people who have never specially worked on themselves, which I would call, reflecting reality upside down. Quote, Every man who can think even a little seriously, without being so to speak, identified, with his passion, must agree with this as he takes into account only one simple fact often repeated in the process of our inner life, namely, that all our experiences that seem so dreadful while we are going through them appear to our logical reasoning to be, not worth a red cent, after a lapse of only a short time, during which they have been replaced by other experiences and chance to be recalled when we are already in another mood. 
the results of his thinking and few and often the average man to make, as it might be expressed, a fly out of an elephant and an elephant out of a fly. The manifestations of this harmful property in the common presence of people become particularly intense during such events as wars, revolutions, civil wars, and so on at such times of state, recognizable even by them, is most acutely manifested, under the influence of which is rare exceptions they all fall, and which they call, mass psychosis. The chief characteristic of this state is that when ordinary people with their already feeble mentation, which at such times become still feebler, the chief stops from the maleficent stories of some lunatic or other, they become in the full sense of the word victims of these malicious stories and manifest themselves completely automatically. While they are under the influence of this maleficent property, already permanently rooted in ordinary contemporary people, there ceases to exist in their common presence that sacred something called conscience whose acquisition was possible for them thanks to the data with which they were endowed by great nature, as godlike beings in contrast to mere animals. Knowledgeable people sincerely regret this property in our contemporaries because, according to historical data as well as the discoveries of many genuine learned beings of past epics, great nature no longer has any need for such a phenomenon as mass psychosis for maintaining her equilibrium on the contrary. The periodic manifestation of this property in people compels her again and again to make new adaptations, for instance, increasing the birth rate, changing what is called the tempo of the general psyche, and so on and so forth. Everything I have said, I consider it necessary to emphasize further that all the historical data that have reached certain contemporary people and have also happened to become known to me concerning what really did occur in the life of people of former times, and not just those data invented by contemporary so-called scholars, chiefly the Germans, whose History has stuck the brains of all the rising generation almost everywhere on earth. Clearly show that men of past ethics should not divide into two streams of life, but that all flowed along in a single river. The general life of mankind has been divided into two streams only since the time of what is called the Tikliamitian civilization, which immediately preceded the Babylonian civilization. From that time on there was gradually established the present mode of existence of mankind which, as every sane thinking man must acknowledge, can flow more or less tolerably only if people are divided into masters and slaves. Although to be either masters or slaves is equally unworthy of men as children of our common father, yet, in Existing conditions already thoroughly fixed in the process of the collective life of people, the origin of which lies in remote antiquity, we must be reconciled to this and accept a compromise, which according to an impartial reasoning corresponds to our own personal welfare and at the same time is not contrary to the commandments specially issuing to us men from the prime source of everything existing. Quote, such a compromise is possible, in my opinion, if certain people consciously undertake, as the chief aim of their existence, to acquire in their presence of all the corresponding data to become masters among those around them similar to themselves. Proceeding from this and acting according to the wise saying of ancient times, 
Mitchell affirms that, in order to be a just and good altruist, one must first of all be an out and out egoist. Each one of us, making use of the common sense given us by great nature, must set as his chief aim to become a master. But not a master in the sense that this word conveys to contemporary people, namely, one who has many slaves and much money, usually handed down by inheritance, but in the sense of a man who, thanks to his objectively virtuous acts toward those around him, that is, acts manifested according to the dictates of his pure reason alone, without the least participation of those impulses engendered in him as in all people by the consequences of the properties of that maleficent organ kind of upper, acquires in himself that something which impels all those around him to bow before him and with reverence to carry out his orders. I now consider this first series of my writings completed, and completed in just such a form as satisfies even myself. In any case, I give myself my word that from tomorrow I shall not spend even five more minutes of my time on this first series. Before setting to work on the second series of my writings, in order to give it a form accessible to everyone, I intend to rest for a whole month, to write absolutely nothing and, for a stimulus to my organism, to keep to the extreme limit, slowly to drink the still remaining 15 bottles of super most super heavenly nectar, which at the present time is known on Earth as Old Calvados. This old Calvado, by the way, 27 bottles of it, I was considered worthy to find by accident buried under a mixture of lime, sand, and finely chopped straw, several years ago when I was digging a pit for storing carrots for the winter in one of the cellars of my present chief dwelling place. The bottles of this divine liquid were buried in all probability by monks who had lived in this place, far from worldly temptation, for the salvation of their souls. It now seems to me that it was not without some ulterior motive that they buried these bottles there, and that, by virtue of what is called there, intuitive perspicacity, the data for which, one must assume, were formed in them thanks to their pious lives, they foresaw that this divine wicked would fall into hands worthy of understanding the meaning of such things, and that it would stimulate the owner of these hands to sustain the meaning of the ideals on which the corporation of these monks was founded and assist their better transmission to the next generation. During this rest of mine, fully deserved from any point of view, I wish to drink this splendid liquid, which alone during recent years has given me the possibility of tolerating, without suffering, beasts similar to myself around me, and to listen to new anecdotes, and sometimes for lack of new ones, old ones, provided, of course, that the storyteller is a good one. It is still midday, and as I have given my word not to write anything further for this first series, starting only from tomorrow, I still have time and, without breaking my word, can add with a clean conscience that a year or two ago I categorically decided to publish only the first series of my writings as regards the second and third series. My intention was not to publish them but to organize their distribution in order, among other things, to fulfill through them one of the fundamental tasks I have set myself under and both, namely, to prove to all my contemporaries, cost what it may, the 
security is all their inherent ideas concerning the supposed existence of a certain other world, with its famous and so beautiful of paradise, and is still repugnant of hell, and at the same time to establish theoretically and afterward demonstrate practically, so that even a complete victim of contemporary education would have to understand, not without a shudder, that hell and paradise do indeed exist, only not in another world, but here beside us on earth. After the publication of the first series, I intend, for the spreading of the ideas contained in the second series, to organize in various large centers simultaneous public readings accessible to all. And as regards the real, indubitably comprehensible objective truths that have been brought to light by me in the third series, I wish to make this series accessible exclusively to those who, after listening to the second series of my writing, will be selected by specially prepared people according to my considered instructions.
www.hollybooks.com
Archaeology and Sources 4 Old Testament Background In the past 200 years, archaeology has experienced a huge information explosion in terms of both artifacts and texts from the ancient Near East. Every item must be placed into a large historical context, and, where relevant, must cautiously be placed in a proper relationship to biblical material. Properly identified and interpreted, archaeological materials may illustrate, illuminate, demonstrate, confirm, or challenge the biblical text. These same artifacts and texts cannot be used at a theological level to prove the spiritual, religious, or theological claims of the biblical text. It is obviously impossible for a state or a trowel to prove or disprove the spiritual revelations and assertions of scripture. But these materials may confirm and make plausible certain historical perspectives and claims of those texts. It is fair to say that archaeology validates Hebrew history and explains many formerly obscure terms and traditions in both the Ottoman. It thus provides an authentic background for the prophecies culminating in Jesus Christ. The development of biblical archaeology. Modern archaeology in the Middle East began when Napoleon took with him into Egypt, 1798, a team of specialists to record the ancient wonders of Egypt. They happened to find the Rosetta Stone 1799 which provided the unexpected key to the decipherment of Egyptian hieroglyphics 1819, 1822, the floodgates opened to a heightened interest in the wonders of the ancient Near East and to the light they might shed on the Bible, the ancient Near East's greatest religious, literary, and historical artifact. In 1845, Akkadian, the language of Old Babylon, was deciphered using the Behistun inscription, 518 BC, which, like the Rosetta Stone, was inscribed in three languages. The deciphering of several other languages soon followed. After that, the archaeology of the ancient Near East prospered and drew worldwide attention. Archaeologists, scholars, and treasure hunters were amazed at the creation and flood stories, legal documents, ancient civilizations and languages, religious and theological systems, sacrificial rituals, tabernacles, temples, palaces, wisdom literature, covenants and covenantal forms and rituals, war stories, birth stories, king lists, pagan prophetic parallels, and much more. In the beginning, it was treasure hunters who made many of the significant finds, and their methods were often haphazard and caused. Destruction of important archaeological sites. The scientific study of ancient tells strata of dirt and cultural debris compacted together into mounds over the millennia began in Palestine in 1890, when Flinders Petrie adopted methods used to excavate Troy, systematically unearthing and studying the various strata layers of occupation of a city. This approach to archaeology in Palestine flourished as appropriate techniques, tools, and record-keeping developed. Today, a combination of methods is employed, including surface surveys and aerial photography used to get information about whole regions. The Contribution of Biblical Archaeology Various ancient Near Eastern texts and artifacts have helped scholars paint, both with a broad brush and in some cases with detail, a cultural and historical backdrop of odd eras across the centuries. 
Ancient texts and artifacts help us see the odd in its larger context and better understand its history, its literary qualities, and even its theological perspectives. In principle, archaeologists have no particular interest in proving the truth of the scriptures. And in fact, it is sometimes difficult to reconcile interpretations of archaeological data and the evidence of scripture. Such conflicts are few in number, however, and tend to diminish noticeably as new in form. Fashion is forthcoming. The huge cache of ancient Near Eastern material makes the historical reliability of the odd arguably firm. These archaeological source materials show the people of Israel as fellow participants in the ancient Near East of their day. It is possible to see the men and women of scripture as real persons, as true children of their age, grappling with life's problems. And from time to time they catch a vision of God as all-powerful and all-holy, as guiding the destinies of individuals and nations, and as bringing about his purposes and history. Ancient texts and artifacts show that Israel shared in the social structures and worldviews of the surrounding cultures. The these texts and artifacts also show striking contrasts. Between the people of Israel and the world in which they live, for Israel claimed a relationship with the Lord, the one true God, and did not worship many gods as neighboring nations did. The people of Israel's faith in an experience of the Lord makes them unique in the ancient world, a uniqueness that comes into vibrant, colorful relief through the texts and artifacts of the ancient Near East. Primary sources: Rain Zorki, Arnold and Brian E. Bayer, Readings from the Ancient Near East, 2002. Cuz William W. Hello, Ed. The Context of Scripture, 2003. Archaeology and Sources for Old Testament Background. Point eight A E L Miriam Licktime Ancient Egyptian Literature 1971-1980 OTP Victor H Matthews and Don C Benjamin Eds Old Testament Parallels Laws and Stories from the Ancient Near East 2006 A Net James B Richard Ed Ancient Near Eastern texts relating to the Old Testament, 1969, at H.B. Cantonal. Sparks, Ancient Texts for the Study of the Hebrew Bible, 2005, Further Reading Susan Wise Bauer, The History of the Ancient World, 2007, Richard S. Tess, Israelite Religion. An Archaeological and Biblical Survey, 2007, Alfred J. Hertz, Archaeology in the Old Testament, 1998, K. A. Kitchen, On the Reliability of the Old Testament, 2006, John H. Walton, Ancient Near Eastern Thought in the Old Testament, 2006, Michael O. Wise, et al. The Dead Sea Scrolls, 2005, Ancient Texts and Artifacts Relating to the Old Testament. The Old Testament was written in a complex era of history, and 